This message is for anyone that considers themselves a Christian. What you are going to hear in this video is not designed to attack you or harm you in any way, but rather to help you. I am not passing judgment upon you, nor am I interested in converting you to yet another religion. I am, however, hoping to provide you with the information that may help you to change your current role in the battle of good versus evil from that of a spectator to that of a warrior. Take nothing I say in this video at face value. Instead, take everything that is offered here and research it thoroughly for yourself and draw your own conclusions. Also, you may notice that there is no music or soundtrack in the background, which is a method frequently employed by people to evoke an emotional response from the listener. I will use some imagery to anchor certain points in the video, but I will attempt to refrain from ones that are designed specifically to provoke an emotional response. As a recovering evangelical Christian, I understand why you believe what you believe and how you got to this point. You are caught in a trap that was designed specifically to cage you and to disable you. As a result, you bear very little resemblance to the one that you call your savior. This is not your fault, and I'm going to explain why. To the best of my ability and in the time allotted, I will attempt to explain in a sequential order how the deception of modern Christianity came to be and why. This is in no way a comprehensive analysis, but it will furnish you with enough information for you to begin freeing your mind and your spirit. Throughout all of recorded history, there has existed a priest class. The role of the priest class is to hide or occult the truths of the nature of creation and who and what the human being actually is. The priest class wraps every lie within a carefully constructed lattice of truth. This makes it nearly impossible to separate the truth from the lies. In the days of the man we call Jesus, there were a number of priest classes in control. If you are familiar with biblical writings, then you are no doubt aware of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. These players had firm control on the monotheistic faith of the day and on moral law. Without going into great detail here, the Judaic or Yehudic religions span more than 3,000 years and combine a number of different disciplines from hundreds of various texts. It was one of the first, if not the first, monotheistic religions in recorded history. At the head of the Judaic faith is the deity known by non-Jews as Yahweh, more exactly represented by the Tetragrammaton, which is translated as YHWH in English. This comes from the original Hebrew yod heh vav -Heh. This entity is known in a purely masculine context and displays attributes ranging from kind and benevolent to bloodthirsty, jealous, and vengeful. It is important to note that while Jews were not allowed to pronounce his name, their God does in fact have a name, or several as it may be. It is also important to note that the word God is essentially a title and not a name. While the modern Bible implies that there is only one God described in all of the ancient texts, the translations say something entirely different. That in the Old Testament alone, there may be several gods mentioned. Yahweh required regular blood sacrifice in order for the people to be absolved from their sins. While most people today believe that these sacrifices were done strictly on animals, there is evidence, even in the modern Bible, that humans were not off limits. But even if the emphasis was just on animals, ask yourself, why did they believe that the murdering of innocent animals could pay for sins? In addition to blood sacrifice, the Judaic texts are loaded with rituals and laws. While most of these rituals do not make sense to people of today, it makes them no less important. Failure to perform these rituals in that day, even accidentally, often resulted in the death of the individual unfortunate enough to have made the mistake. 
oftentimes the people that were in the best graces of Yahweh fit into two main categories, warriors and sorcerers. One of the greatest sorcerers of all time was the king named Solomon. He is known in the ancient scriptures not only to communicate with demons, but to bind them and to use them for his purposes here on earth. Because of the amount of ritual blood sacrifice done by Solomon and his priests, scholars outside of the Bible actually report blood running ankle deep into the streets from his temple during the high holy days. It may surprise you to discover that so-called Christians existed before the one we call Jesus, by as much as 200 years. These groups are vaguely referred to today as Gnostic Christians. These groups included the Essenes, the Ebionites, and the Nazarenes, just to name a few. The word Gnostic comes from the word Gnosis, which means knowledge. The Gnostic Christians understood things and practiced things that today would be considered highly blasphemous in the modern church. Things like reincarnation, self-governance, civil disobedience, and the non-aggression principle. Also, they were strict vegetarians. They acknowledged both a feminine creator, often referred to as mother, and a male creator, often referred to as father. Because of their beliefs, the Gnostic Christians did not blindly submit to systems of authority or to the ruling priest class. But because of their non-aggression principles, they were known for living peacefully not only among themselves, but with other groups of people. However, they were capable of defending themselves, and some groups were not particularly peaceful when resisting oppression. The person that we call Jesus today was not called Jesus when he walked the earth. According to proper Aramaic translations, he was more likely known as Yeshua. This is further supported by the fact that there was no J in his language. The origins of the name Jesus are foggy at best, since it is neither a translation nor a transliteration of the original name. The Yeshua in scriptures was from Nazareth. It was said by some that Nazareth was more of an outcast haven or a penal colony than it was a city. While he is said to be from Nazareth as an adult, we see evidence that he spent as many as 12 years of his childhood in Egypt during King Herod's reign. This would have given him access to some of the most enlightened Gnostic teachers of his day, which has been speculated by several historians. No matter what may have happened in Egypt, Jesus of Nazareth was less than obedient when it came to the laws and the customs of his day. Some of his offenses included underage teaching in the temples, healing people on the Sabbath, driving the money changers out of the temples, socializing with women in public places, and public defiance and ridicule of the priest class. Even though it is not historically accurate, for the balance of this presentation, I'll refer to this person as Jesus, as that is the most familiar name to those listening. Most people believe that they have heard the gospel of Jesus. But have they really? The word gospel means essentially good news. So with that said, which one of these two gospel scenarios or good news scenarios sounds more likely? Here is the first and historically accepted scenario. Number one, you are all hideous and wretched in the eyes of Yahweh. Number two, so far animal sacrifice and human sacrifice prior to that has not satisfied Yahweh. Number three, to put an end to blood sacrifice, I, Jesus, will actually become a blood sacrifice myself. Number four, if you allow this, and if people in the future endorse it, you and they will be safe from the punishment of Yahweh. Here is the second and hidden scenario. Number one, cast off your chains, 
release yourself from your captors and their systems of entrapment. 2. Original sin is a lie. The ills of humankind are a product of the control paradigm and the lies that you've been told. Number three, the creator resides inside of you and you are one with him. You can never be separate from him no matter what. Number four, you require no intermediaries between you and the creator. Number five, because of this, you are eternally powerful unless you choose not to be. And like me, you can once again do miraculous things. The real message of Jesus was that you and I are sovereign. That is because you and I are sons and daughters of the creator of the universe and one with it. There is no authority outside of yourself. This information tore down the control matrix of his day, and this is ultimately what got him killed.